Good afternoon, my friends. Welcome to today's reading of Love Stories and Wars. Today we're going to read three chapters because this will be the final reading of Love Stories and Wars. We are near the end and the last couple of chapters, at least the very last one, isn't very long. So we will, like I said, just combine three chapters. It's really been a lot of fun for me to read through this entire trilogy with you all. I realize that not all of you are reading this live, some are catching up later. I did want to say that uh, depending on the quarantine and depending on different factors, I was thinking about the possibility of having a video where I uh, talk a little bit about the significance of this story, what it's about from my perspective and that sort of thing. So if that would interest you, whenever you get around to watching this video, if you want to send me a uh, maybe a private message about that or even just put it in the comments on this video if you watch it on the uh, on Facebook live streaming rather than YouTube if you'd like me to give a little uh, talk about what the story's about and why I wrote it and just you know some of the significance let me know maybe we'll do that maybe we won't however that may be this morning we're going to finish the story up Chapter 24, Reunions <clears throat> Once Tyagon and Benel had left, Bonson asked, So what are you all doing for the rest of the day? I want to go find our babies, Hope said. Babies? Pryor asked. <laughs> oh, the wolves. Yes, Hope said. Well, this one I've got to see, Pryor said, and the four set off together. Through a series of inquiries, they found out that the wolves were kept chained in a stable near the arena. The Doc Manon was going to have them killed in some horrible way, but he had not gotten around to it before Alva killed him. They made their way to the stable and found the Doc Monian keepers had fled. The wolves were chained up in stalls, and there were two Huron stable keepers who had been feeding them, but had not dared to go near them. As Alva and Hope entered, they began jerking at their chains and yapping in a desperate, yet friendly way. Hey, fellas, Alva said. Unchain them and let them out, Hope told the keepers. They won't hurt you. The keepers looked uncertain. Give me the keys if you must, she said. The keepers mounted their courage and entered the stalls one by one, unchaining the twelve wolves and letting them out. As they bounded forward, Alva and Hope moved to the center of the stable. Hope began caressing them and speaking sweetly. Alva spoke to them in a childlike voice, calling them puppies, and began wrestling around with them in the straw. Aren't you glad Mama's here? Hope said, she doesn't think you're horrendous. She's mad at Papa for calling you horrendous. <laughs> but you are, aren't you? The twelve gigantic wolves were clamoring for the attention of Alva and Hope, who were giving it lavishly. So, are you two going to do this all day? Pryor asked. I think so, Alva said. Of course we are, Hope said. These are our babies. They didn't eat Alva, did you babies? We owe them everything. They're going to come live with us, aren't you babies? Our other babies are going to play with them and ride them, aren't they? Aren't they? The wolves were yapping delightedly. Well, I've seen it, Pryor said. While they're busy with their babies, what say we go find some ale, Bonson? Sounds all right to me, Bonson said. We'll catch, catch up with you at the palace later at dinner, Alva said. That evening they ate in the throne room once again. Tyagon had seen to it that they all had quarters near the top of the palace, where the finest rooms were. He had also sent riders to Lassania to give the news and request for Phylon and many of his lords to come to Crondon, including all of Alva's associates and, of course, Salia and Nira. They would arrive in a few days. As our six companions were eating dinner that evening, the front doors were open to let the cool air in. The gates were now guard guarded by two Huron soldiers. One of the two men came to the, to the doors, 
looking rather ragged, and began talking to the guards. I was wondering when you'd show up, Alva shouted across the hall, for it was Hendren the second, accompanied by Holen. Come in and eat, Alva said, and bring your friend. Hendren and Holen approached the table and both bowed down on one knee. Those seated at the table rose. Rise, my friends, Tyagon said. Then the two men stood up. Alva ran around to embrace his young friend. And who is your friend? he asked. This is Holen. We met in prison and he helped me escape. My kind of man, Alva said, extending his hand. I am Alva. Holen took, Holen took his hand, but it was at a loss for words in the company of so many great persons. I don't believe you ever met the hero of Lassania, Alva said to Hendren, but this is his majesty, King Tyagon, now emperor of Huron. On his left is Lord Benel the Brave, Lord Bonson's father. Hendren suppressed his confusion while Alva introduced Holen to the others. When Hendren and Holen had eaten, Alva asked for the story of their escape, which brought many cheers and toasts. They had ridden west of the river and had had to keep going further west to avoid scouts looking for Alva, but had headed for Crondon the moment after they experienced Hope's light and heard her song. Along the way, they had heard some loose accounts of what had happened, but now they got the whole story. After dinner that night, Alva, Bonson, Pryor, and Hendren took the bodies of the Dachmanan and Prince Matarin in a horse cart out to a deserted place. They built a large bonfire and burned the bodies. While the fire burned, the four men dug a deep pit. When the fire burned out, they shoveled all the ashes into the pit together with the bones and buried them. Then they went back to Crondon, bathed, and had a long sleep. When the party from Lassania arrived, there were many happy reunions. Nira had little Alsala with her, and Salia was very near to giving birth but had chanced the journey because she wanted to be with Bonson when the baby was born. Many apologies were in order as well. Lord Benel apologized to Lord Hellel for being wrong about virtually everything, and said that, though it was too much to hope, he did hope their friendship could be restored. Hellel said that it was silly for one of the men who helped Alva Dene slay the Dachmanan to apologize for anything and observed that Benel would not have been there to help if he had stayed in Lassania. Hellel apologized to Hope for calling her plan foolish. Hope said that it was, but she learned foolish plans from the best, and she was glad she had her mentor's knack for choosing ones that worked. Once Bonson had had time to give a good greeting to his wife, it was time for Pensor's apology. He walked up to Bonson and said, oh, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Alva was always right about you, and I was always wrong. You weren't always wrong, Bonson said. People change, Pinsor. Alva changes people. We all know how many mistakes I've made, including thinking I could change people the way Alva did. Well, not even hope can change everyone. Some men just aren't interested, but you ain't one of them. From now on, you've got my sword just as much as Alva does. Well, now that we've got Alva back, we can all just follow him again. We won, Pinsor. Alva and Hope won. Let's forget all this. Pinsor nodded and the men embraced his brothers. In the weeks ahead, there was a lot of feasting, as well as many meetings among kings, lords, and heads of the army. They spent countless hours discussing how to best carry out Tyagon's decrees. Phylon supported his friend fully and pledged to help in any way possible. The two kings swore eternal friendship between Lassania and Huron. They would not merge, but would continue as the Twin Kingdoms, and help one another whenever needed. To start with, Lassania would provide leadership for re-establishing the Huron army. Many Huron captains and generals had been deposed by Dachman. Those who had not been killed had capitulated. While this was originally under the direction of Terraphon, it still seemed to render them unfit for leadership. 
Lacinia had many hardy warriors who would fill this need. Salia II was born two days after her mother arrived in Lacinia. Had Sal been there, he would have said that she was a dead ringer for her mother. This was obvious enough by looking at her face, especially her eyes. Her mother and father were delighted with her, but the most delighted of all seemed to be Lord Benel. He had liked Salia from the first disapproving look she gave him. Perhaps she thought she would beat him to the punch by disapproving first, but he smiled, said she was charming, and asked if he would be permitted to kiss his new daughter. Salia felt anything but charming, and was softened a little. In the days that followed, they began to become friends, and when Lord Benel was introduced to the baby, he burst into sobs. He had never had much of a family life. Bonson's mother had spent her life in the social world while he spent his time maneuvering in political circles. Bonson had essentially been raised by nurses and swordmasters, and Benel's wife had died young from a sudden illness. He was away on business at the time. Salia II's birth was a new part of Lord Benel's rebirth. For the last few days, he and his son had began to have a real relationship for the first time, and now he would be able to share in his family. As victory celebrations continued, the Lassanian minstrels came to Crondon to join in the rejoicing. Pryor and Hope also worked together to compose a number of duets celebrating the triumph of the light. As circumstances would have it, Pryor the Mighty found himself in the company of the tall, green-eyed minstrel he had noticed at the banquet in Grinvier nearly two season changes earlier. It did not take long for the two to fall in love and make plans to marry very soon. Salia recovered from birth very quickly. Hope was so full of joy and light that pain and sickness were hardly felt by anyone in the city. Two days after little Salia's birth, her mother was carrying her around the palace and introducing her to the occupants. When she was first introduced to Alva and Hope, Hope was holding little Alsala, who was five months old. When they showed him the baby girl for the first time in his life, he smiled. This made the two couples smile warmly as well. Alva gave Bonson a nearly imperceptible wink, and Salia said, You watch out for Danae's baby girl. Within two weeks, Alva and Hope were preparing for their journey. It was being decided who, besides King Tyagon, would go with them. Nero would accompany Hope, of course, and Bonson and Salia were invited. Pensor's wife, who had come with her husband from Lassania, expressed concern about, tra about so much traveling for little Alsala and Salia II at their age, especially through a war-torn empire. Hope said that the fighting was finished, and Salia said that the healthiest place her baby could be was close to Hope wherever she might be. For herself, Salia was delighted to go. She had always dreamed of traveling, and this journey would exceed her wildest dreams. Hender and the Second would come as well, but Chavin would stay in Huron as an important captain in the army. Tyagon would need a regent to see to business in Huron while he was gone. The most logical choice would have been Hellel, but he would accompany the king because Tyagon had an even more important task for him. Benel considered himself a failed politician and he desired to be close to his son, daughter-in-law, and granddaughter, and he also felt it beneficial to be near hope for his full recovery from the Crondon dungeon. Thus, he would go on the journey as well. <clears throat> it was determined that Lord Deron would act as regent. Tyagon knew him well and his court experience, as well as his heroism in the war, and all of this made him an ideal candidate. Pensor would remain in Lassania as the head of the army until Bonson should return and let him retire, and Pryor was asked by Tyagon to act as head of the Huron army. Alva told these men that no two men had more right to accompany him on his journey, but he was in great need of their service at home. With his coming marriage, Pryor did not think it best to go anyway. Living in the Crondon Palace as a newlywed, training and managing soldiers, and keeping company with Lord Deron would be a fine reward for his service. Still, part of him regretted not going with Alva and Hope. Pensor would also have ample reason to stay behind. 
though he too was remiss about not keeping Alva's company. After everything, his wife had earned some time with her husband at home. But there was more. Hope's radiance was creating what could only be described as a new birth for the land. Trees blossomed, animals multiplied, and more couples than ever before in history found themselves expecting new additions to their family. Both Hope and Salia would be carrying new babies by the time they set out. Hendren the healer headed straight home after he heard the war was over, wanting to see his wife more than take part in celebrations in Curin. Bally would find herself expecting a fresh set of twins soon after her husband's return. After the discovery, she said, What made Hope think I wanted to be pregnant again at my age? I don't think it works like that, I said. I don't think she deliberately decides who has babies. Oh, shut up, Bally had said, but she would delight in her twin boys once they were born. Throughout the land, many wives who had never been able to have children found themselves expecting, as well as many women who had been thought to be beyond childbearing years. Alva had been born when his mother was 45, and Pensor had once remarked that he had never heard of another woman giving birth that old. As circumstances would have it, Pensor's own wife would find herself expecting a child at 65, a son as Hope informed the gray-haired mother and father. Unlike Bally, Pensor's wife had no complaint. In Hope's presence, she felt young again, and as much as she and her husband loved their five grown daughters, they were delighted to finally have a little boy as well. Bonson wanted to name... Bonson wanted to name Alva for his first son, so Pensor decided that his boy's name would be Bonson. A man I never expected, named after a man I never expected, he said. Soon enough, the journey commenced. Hope, Alva, and their companions set out, accompanied by 500 soldiers. There was a parade in the city to celebrate their departure. Chapter 25 The Healing of the Lands the travel was leisurely. Many of the soldiers brought wives with them, and Hope's visit to the various lands that composed the Huron and Dachmonian empires would be thorough, but not rushed. As they rode, Hope would spend hours singing, sometimes in the High Lassanian, sometimes in the common tongue. Sometimes her songs were about the healing and blooming of the land, and other times they were humor and fun. In addition to singing, there was much fun, feasting, and conversation. In addition to the people and the horses, the twelve Aknanian wolves accompanied them. They made the other travelers nervous at first, but Hope had changed these former monsters into gentle, obedient pets. Of course, she never referred to them as pets. They were always her and Alva's babies. For his part, Alva always called them puppies, and he played with them like a child playing with puppies. As they passed through, the lands bloomed, and those that had been dry experienced refreshing rains. When they passed through villages and cities, people would gather for miles around to gaze on Hope. Many came forward to have her put her hands on their children. Others brought sick family members who were healed in her presence. When they passed through Nan, it was bittersweet for Nira. She was very happy to be freed from Dachmonian rule, or she was very happy to see it freed from Dachmonian rule, but none of her family was still alive. Tyagon had suggested that, as one with the right to be queen, she should assume the throne. Nira thanked him, but said that that was not her life anymore. She would prefer to stay with Hope, wherever they would go. Most kingdoms preferred to remain part of the Huron Empire rather than become independent. It had been a long time since most had been conquered, and many had joined Huron willingly. There was a sense of Huron pride, and Tyagon was a man who inspired incredible trust. Among the exceptions was Aknon. Hope had some concerns that they might be trouble someday, 
and Alva suggested that Tyagon be sure the surrounding nations had strong garrisons. Tyagon agreed. When they crossed into the formerly Dachmonian lands, it was much the same. Having lived under the terror of Dachman, they were happy to come under the protective wings of Huron, their strong connection to Lassania and the light. Broken lands were healed. Dry, fruitless land blossomed and bloomed. When it came time to enter Dachman itself, Nira said at first that she would never again set foot there. Hope told her that that was okay and they would find her a place to wait. Nira quickly changed her mind, deciding that she would go wherever Hope went. Hope rode into the heart of Dachman, singing songs about healing and new life all the way. Dachman was composed mainly of hard, dry ground and rocks, but as they rode in, there was a gentle rain for several days. After the rain, springs welled up, causing streams and grass and trees and flower fields began to grow. Hope declared that Dachman was no more, and this land would now be called Lassivarden, which in the High Lassanian means Western Light. Per Tyagon's plans, Lord Hellel was installed as the governor of this land and charged to see that it grew and prospered in the light. Hope was sorry that he would be separated from Hellel by so far a distance, but Hellel said that his whole life had been preparation for this task, and that all that belonged to him in Lassania was now the property of Alva and herself. Tombus and Jagrock had accompanied Hellel on the journey and would stay with him. All in all, Hope's journey lasted three years. Little Alsala had early years well fitted for a Danae. Every afternoon, he watched his father and Bonson sword fight. He watched them not as a child being entertained, but as though he was studying what they were doing. Not long after he learned to walk, he picked up a stick and began mimicking the moves. Alva and Bonson were delighted. Alva carved him a size-appropriate wooden sword, and they began teaching him sword play even as he learned to talk. Hmm. Al-Salah was constantly observing the world around him, always staring intently as though he were putting things together and understanding how they worked, whether it was caterpillars, clouds, or people. He was always very serious. Alva once teased him, and he made an affronted look, as though he were not being taken seriously enough. Alva said, Pardon me, my lord Danae. After this... Alva began addressing him by this title regularly. Hope said not to tease him, but Al Salah seemed to take it seriously, as though the title were appropriate. Before long, all the soldiers in the camp would salute him as My Lord Danae as he walked by. Little Al Salah would nod in acknowledgement, much to the, de to the delight of all. All except Hope, that is. Don't give him a big head she said to Alva. I'm not, Alva said. He's not proud. He just knows who he is. He's a Danae. He can have an awareness of his greatness as a neutral fact, without any pride involved. You never acted like you were aware of your greatness, she said. Pardon me, Alva said. He's an Al-Salah Danae. Still, Hope insisted that her son address adults as Sir, Madam, Mr., or Mrs., and she took great care to ensure that he always spoke to them as his elders rather than his subordinates. It must be said that, though both of Al-Salah's parents loved him, Alva's delight was the greater. This is because, in look and manner, he was exactly like his grandfather and nothing like his father. We should also say that Alva was correct. Al-Salah was not proud, though with his mother's guidance this might have been a danger, or though without his mother's guidance this might have been a danger. As the first child born as both a Danae and a luminary, he had an awareness from birth of his destiny as the king's own shield. He had been conceived just before the most important battle in history, 
and had had a certain awareness of his place in the world the moment he was alive. A power for light, truth, and goodness had emanated from him as a newly conceived baby in Hope's womb, and it had contributed to breaking the power of Matarin and the Dachmanon. One more thing about our young friend we must address, his play. Al-Salah had no interest in play. He was only concerned with that which was productive and educational. There was one exception, however. When both could walk, Al-Salah and Sally II were, each, were in each other's company as often as they could be, which was a great deal for their first three years. While on the journey, Salia was a dead ringer for her mother, but her temperament was gentle rather than fiery. She loved to play with dolls, cradling and feeding them like babies. Not long after she had begun this play, without a word, she handed a doll to Al Salah, who obediently cradled and patted it as though he were its father. After this, he had regular duties of holding dolls, attending tea parties, and such like. Once, while all four parents were watching them, Hope said, Don't you think they're a little young for that? Probably, Alva said, but I'm not fool enough to come between a Danae and his lady. I'm serious, Hope said. So am I, Alva replied. As the play seemed harmless, the parents decided to let the matter be, but the two toddlers continued to behave as though they were a little married couple. Hope and Salia remained uneasy, while Alva and Bonson thought it was great fun. But for the children, it was no joke. Chapter 26 Epilogue When Alva, Hope, Bonson, and Salia returned to Lassania, Hope and Salia each had three children, and Hope was expecting a set of twins. After all Salah, Dana was born to Alva and Hope. She had Alva's looks and Hope's temperament. Thus, while not beautiful in a conventional way, she had a permeating sweetness that pervaded the world around her. After Dana came Lorraine, with light brown hair and green eyes. She was happy and mischievous. Bonson and Salia were to have seven children in all, three boys and four girls. After Salia the second, Bonson and Salia welcomed their little Alva, followed by little Kiel, Nira, Hamar, Janae, and Lacey. Bonson once joked that he wanted to finally defeat Alva by having more children, but this was not to be. With an eye roll, Salia observed that hope never changed and was likely to live forever while she would have to stop at seven. While Hope did not live forever, she and Alva were to have fifteen children in all. Time fails to speak of all of them. Some things must be left to the reader's imagination, but we will comment briefly on the first seven. The day Al Salah turned sixteen, he was given command of the Lassanian army, and Bonson retired. Five months later, the day Salia II turned 16, the two were married and began a family of their own. Al Salah's only real military action would involve putting down the Aknanian uprising, but this was not difficult. When Al Salah spoke in normal tones, his voice was like a mighty wind. When he spoke with the slightest displeasure, it was like thunder. Only once was his voice ever raised when he commanded the Aknanian army to surrender, and the sound of his voice melted their hearts. Luckily for the world, Al Salah was genuinely good. He was only a terror to those who would do evil. Some said he was the greatest Danae, but most would always reserve that title for his seemingly less impressive father. Al Salah agreed. Dana devoted her life to healing. When she became a woman at 16, she asked to spend some time with Hendren Sr. in Alva's home village and learn the healing arts. Alva observed that only her presence and possibly her touch would be needed for healing, and her mother could teach her everything else anyway. But Dana wanted to go nevertheless. She spent months learning from Hendren things she already knew or could guess, but there was something of his spirit she wanted to learn from. Her mother was magical, and so was she, but she wanted to understand healing from the perspective of a man who had dedicated his life to it without a magic touch. 
As circumstances would have it, she married Hendren and Bally's younger twin, and the two became traveling healers throughout Lacinia, the Huron Empire, and beyond. As for Lorraine, Alva joked that she should have been named Keel, though this was the name of Bonson's second son. He said this because she constantly made jokes, sang funny songs, and told funny stories. She was the life of every party. She also had a love for weapons and fighting. As soon as she was able, she joined her brother's rough play, not acting the part of a maiden, but of a warrior. Alva and Nira saw that all the girls were competent with a sword, but unlike her sisters, Lorraine loved it. When she grew up, she became the first woman to compete in the military games, both in archery and broadsword fighting. She became the ten-time champion in archery and even won the broadsword event one year. When she was done competing, she became a bow instructor in the Lassanian army and eventually married an archery captain whom she herself had trained. Alva and Hope's twin boys would be named Burgon and Tyagon. Finally, Hope got two boys that acted like Alva, though they looked more like her father. Like Lorraine, these boys loved a good joke. Unlike Alcala, they loved play, usually rough play, wielding wooden swords and conquering imaginary kingdoms. While their older brother did not play with them, strictly speaking, he would take part as the villain in their battles. The only problem was that his swordsmanship was so superior that the villain always seemed to win. When they grew up, Burgon and Tyagon became great competitors in the military games, along with Bonson's Alva and Prior's Bonson, pardon me, Pensor's Bonson. These four young men traded victory titles back and forth. With four such able competitors, there would be no dominant champion as Bonson had been. Of course, Alsala could defeat any of them in swordsmanship or jousting, and had done so privately, but he had no use for games. None of them could touch Lorraine in archery. The year that Lorraine won the broadsword fighting championship, some said that these four men had let her win, but they always denied it. After the twins came Peace. Ah, Peace. Peace was the first child with Hope's looks, deep blue eyes and radiant golden hair. While all of the children had the power of the luminaries living in them, Peace was the only child who, gl who glowed brightly from the moment of birth. She was always happy, laughing and speaking in incomprehensible babblings from her cradle. At first, Moths, bees, and insects would hover around her cradle as she lavished loving smiles and coos at them. Hope had asked them to leave, which they did. Peace would become a traveling singer, ensuring that the land bloomed and blossomed for years to come. Alva and Hope's seventh child was Honor. There is much to say about Honor. So much, in fact, that we fear he must have a story all of his own. For now, we will observe that he had the face and physique of his paternal grandfather, but the eyes and hair of his mother. The reader may be interested in the fate of a few of our other beloved players in this great game. Both Tyagon and Phylon IV were great rulers, who set the twin kingdoms on a path of greatness that would last hundreds of season changes to come. With Jab Jagrock and Tombus at his sides, Hellel set Lassivarden on the path of light and prosperity. Hendron II and Javin both became governors of Huron provinces, as did many other great warriors in the war. Prior the Mighty returned to Lassania after Tyagon's journey, and he served the Lassanian army as general of the Special Army till the day he died. He served first under Bonson, then under Alcala de Ney the 28th. Glandair returned to the Kiragan Hills and guarded Lassania's eastern border. His sons were made lords in honor of his deeds in the war. Pensor retired as soon as Bonson returned and spent his old age with his wife and son. 
They built a house close to Alva and Hope so that young Bonson could grow up playing with the Denaves. Nebra lived with Alva and Hope till her death, helping to instruct the seemingly endless stream of children. They all moved into Hellel's house in the Camden Mountains, where Hope had grown up. This was the first house in history to be guarded by twelve domesticated Achnanian wolves. Benel lived with his son and daughter-in-law in their ancestral home. He educated his grandchildren and Salia with him. With them, the two had become good friends. He also became great friends with Sal and would sometimes spend spend a few weeks with him in Bracia. Once every five years, Alva and Benel would ride to Crondin, and they and Tyagon would spend two nights and a day together in the dungeon as a way of remembering how close the twin kingdoms had come to disaster. Tyagon would use this time to seek their counsel in various matters, but he was such an able ruler that they had little to contribute. Bonson's ancestral house was roughly two days' ride from the Denae's home. The two families would visit one another as often as possible, sometimes at this house, sometimes at that. Pryor and Pensor would usually attend as well with their families. Alva and Bonson would sword fight, and they would stay up late into the night remembering the joys and sorrows of former days. They would honor their lost friend Keel, who gave his life so that all of this could be. At first, Alva, Bonson, and Pryor would tell Keel stories, but it was not long before Lorraine became the storyteller. At one of these gatherings, not long after the marriage of Al Salah and Sally II, Bonson looked at Hope, as beautiful and radiant as ever. Then he looked at Salia, animatedly talking while Nira listened patiently. She was cheerier, chubbier, and feistier than ever. She was more beautiful than ever. He smiled to himself as he reveled in his own happiness. He remembered a day long ago in the wilderness on the outskirts of Bracia. He had known that it was the most important day of his life, but how wrong he had been about everything else. At first he had thought it was the most important day of his life because it was the day he met Hope. How could he have imagined then that it was because that was the day he met Alva Denae? That's the end, friends. If anybody missed anything, if you want to uh, hear all the readings of all three novel novels, this is available on my YouTube. Peter Vick, last name is V-I-K. Novel number one is Hope, followed by Light and Darkness, and then Love Stories and Wars, which we just finished up. I hope you all had as much fun as I did.